Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is um, our annual, it's our annual theater uh, performance, theater festival performance festival festival. celebrating the work of New York theatre artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of Corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time I think and we feel to start making sense to ask uh, questions why are we making theater but also how are we producing it and for whom and uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community. So I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening. Welcome uh, everybody here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY at Prelude Festival uh, 21. It's uh, uh, day two and we are uh, really thrilled that um, the festival got off to such a good start uh, yesterday um, where we um, had our first discussions and presentations with artists, curators talked about what it means to create work, uh, what has changed, what hasn't and what should. And um, we had our uh, first uh, um, uh, live performance about Hildegard van Bingen and um, Daisy uh, put that out and David talked with her afterwards. For all our viewers, uh, I think 13 works are already streaming uh, ready online. You can go whenever you want and then each day of the week at seven o'clock uh, is a live uh, performance. Today uh, we have our um, chain curating uh, number two we have we ask curators to nominate one artist and the next curator and this curator nominated one artist and the next curator so really this is a an incredible experiment we did and i'm stunned by the results it's truly um, um an open experiment a radical one we think uh, jay wagman helped us you know to come up with this idea and we want to thank him and everybody and today we have a Miriam with us ty stefa declan and mora so welcome where are you guys right now and to tell us a little bit who you are and what you do Mar Mariam, maybe you start sure um hi everybody i'm so happy to be here um, I am dialing in from London. I'm here for a few days. I normally live um, on Lenape land, uh, also called Brooklyn, New York. Um, that's, that's where I live, but I'm here for a couple of days. Fantastic. And this is also a good moment to do an acknowledgement. And uh, we would like to acknowledge the Lenape people upon whose land we are gathered today and also in a way the airwaves where it's coming out you know is is part of part of that land and uh, we pay respect to the Lenape people and ancestors past present and future so um uh, here we go Ty Hey everyone, Buju, Thai Nishnakaz, Waswagnan and Dunjaba coming to you live from the northeast coast here I was in a mountain yesterday in Wabanaki land in Maine, um, people of the first dawn, but then um, made my way down here so I can get some Wi-Fi and had to go close to the city of um, near between like Boston and Bangor. So I am here at the bottom of a mountain to be with you all. And um, But typically my home where I rest and have my things is also in Lenape Hoking in a Canarsie village in Hipster Brooklyn, right down the street from a um, vegan pizza spot that I love. 
Thank you. And Ty is one of our curators. Yeah. Mara? Uh, my name is Mora Garcia. I am Cherokee, non-enrolled in Madame Mesquite, and I'm a dancer, choreographer, and erotic artist, so happily selected by Ty. Uh, right now, I am on Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, which is also Osage traditional homelands, and my original home is uh, in Okanichi Saponi homelands. Fantastic, fantastic. Because Hi, my name is Declan. Uh, I am calling in from Lenape Ho King Land, also Brooklyn. Um, I am a percussionist, a writer, and a chef, and uh, was brought in by Miranda Heyman. And I'm so grateful to be here sharing space with all these wonderful artists. Hi, everyone. I'm Stefa Marina Lercon. Um, I am currently on Lenape Canarsi Lands, aka Bed Stuy, Brooklyn. I am from Queens, New York. Um, I am a vocalist, a composer, a performance artist, um, and I'm really excited to be here um, in space with all of you. I was curated by David Mendizabal, who cannot be with us, um, but um, hopefully I can hold space for him too. So thanks, y'all. Fantastic, and we have your work tonight, right? Yes, yeah, 7 p.m. Um, and how was it creating the work now in the, this strange time of transition where we end? Is it, we don't know if it's Corona, is it over? Or in the middle of it, is theater restarting? Is it not? How does it feel? Um, how does it feel? Um, you know, it, it's, it still feels urgent, but I think in a different a different kind of urgency where I'm not in a rush for other people, but maybe I have this urgency within myself um, to want to kind of let go of some of this work. Um, that I think what COVID did was rearrange some things for me in terms of priorities, you know, and um, and really, you know, um, I think just realizing over and over again, like my art is so connected to my spirit and my center and myself. And if that is not um, maybe in balance or if that is not truly taken care of first, then there's no way that I can do what I want to do the way that I want to do it. So, um, yeah, there's been a lot of um, negotiating with myself and kind of having to 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 be really honest with myself and, and really hear uh, listen um, to to what I need as an artist because that connects to what I need as a as a, a living breathing being. So tell us a bit about the work you created for tonight. What is it about, and why do you think this is important? This is what I would like to share. Um, tonight I'm sharing the Q and Q, which is this kind of first experimentation of um, of what I imagine is like a variety show or um, this kind of like behind the veil look at artists talking to each other um, and sharing space together. And I invited my amazing friend Ita Segev who is a performance artist and a writer and her work has changed my life and it also so happens that we're that we're friends and that we love each other and care about each other and um yeah I, I just imagine this you know like maybe one day in real life maybe one day on some kind of other airwaves or channels to um just play around with um, vulnerabilities and works in progress and kind of like what we call chisme, which is just like chatting, you know, like sharing uh, gossip from our experiences in the theater world and as artists and um, yeah, just creating fun space together because, you know, 
it's hard. It's hard to do this um, and to make a life out of this. And so to have that respite with my community and my friends um, is so integral to, to, to me just, you know, um, going on. Yeah. Thank you. Declan, how is it for you? What's, what is on your mind in these days when you create? What do you think about? What do you dream about? What's missing? What's right? What's wrong? Uh, I, so I write as the pandemic um, struck the world. I was deeply, um, I was working a lot, very much in theater. I was working at New York Theater Workshop um, in the administrative offices and was very like, all in, go, 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 career, theater maker, doing everything I possibly can, filling up all my time, working as many jobs as I needed to work in order to support myself, um, having no no uh, free time to myself to like sit with my thoughts, just like was very go, 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 grind, grind, hustle, hustle, um, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with at some point in our lives. Um, and then, then over like two years, I... Uh, unlearned a lot of that like grind culture um, and hustle culture that I thought was necessary to be like, be a real artist or feel like a real artist. Um, and I have a completely different, a lot, I, 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 I uh, what's the word? Uh, I'll find it. I have a much more holistic approach and I, uh, uh, appreciated a lot of what Stefa said, um, uh, just in terms of like, I, my well being is, is, is paramount to me now, whereas my career was paramount to me before. Um, and now I, 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 maybe I've, I've actually overcorrected and now I uh, am not concerned enough with building this foundation to my career and uh, the, the direction of that. Um, like now, now I, my main source of income is that I'm a sous chef at a restaurant and that is like the happiest, I, it's the happiest I've ever been, the best job I've ever had. Um, and I, I still, you know, it's still important to me that I, that I am making art, that I am performing, that I am doing things like this. Um, and I'm uh, a creative assistant to Miranda Heyman, who was my curator for the festival. Um, and so I am still working. I am still involved in the, the, the theater and performance community in New York. Um, but I, I totally agree with a lot of what Stefa said. Uh, I, if, if this isn't, taken care of I'm not doing anything else you know like like and a lot of a lot of that went into my piece for the festival which is called um how to listen to jazz parentheses and other things I did not learn in music school close parentheses um which is a lot about just how um a lot about how like uh collegiate arts performance programs and obviously I speak very specifically to classical music conservatories. Um, but it, it, a lot of it, a lot of the things I talk about apply to any sort of arts training program in, at a prestigious uh, university or college. Um, but particularly in music, you are taught to be very um, athletic and you're taught to, to be able to recreate the sounds and the, the, the work that's come before you. Um, and obviously there is a lot of value to that in like, knowing your field, knowing your art, knowing like the generations of musicians that come before you. Literally classical music, is, it, is, it, is, it is, you, you are taught explicitly to be able to recreate like the exact same excerpt from a sonata over and over and over again. Like it's not, it's not, about, it's not about being able to express yourself, it's not about being, you know, finding uh, some sort of emotional truth in music or figuring out how to like find something, what, we, what theater people would probably see more as creative music people are, are about recreating perfection. Um, yeah. And so the show is all about what are all the, what are all the bad lessons that I learned from that? Um, and what are all, how are all the ways that that actually set me up to have a very toxic relationship to work and to like grind culture and things like that. But then it also sort of inverts itself at some point in the show, because there are good lessons I learned about pushing myself about uh, hard work um, and there are there are valuable things I gained from from those, and it's it, the show is a lot of me trying to piece out like what are the what are the bad lessons I learned, what are the kernels of truth in that that I gained, um, and so what do I what do I do with that? How do how do I t move that forward? So you you are sharing with us you know this kind of journey, the struggles, and uh, 
you you lived through in that time. I think that is uh, also why, you know, you, you for sure you got selected uh, for that. It will be interesting, and it's interesting to say that you said I went into cooking. I did something different. I'm happiest there, and I think for many artists, um, they face existential questions now. What do I do? I go on? Do I the old clash on? Do I go or do I stay? What do I do? You know, and um, and so this is a moment. And but if you you share it, and we we can uh, you know participate with it. Uh, Mora, how is the moment for you? How and about your work? How does that? Yeah, I was just I'm just sitting here listening. I completely forgot what I was going to say because I've been listening. <laughs> but I really enjoyed uh, what everyone else had to say about self care. You know, um, as a dancer, that's something obviously, you know, I think about a lot because without the vessel, there is no work, you know, without sufficient sleep and some good food and good self-care, it, it, there really is no work. Um, but uh, also this idea of the reason somebody like Mozart, for example, was famous was because he made something new and exciting, but yet you're forced to recreate uh, old things. You know, it's, it's just a kind of funny kind of, it, it just reminds me of traditions getting stuck, getting stuck in time, um, which also kind of reminds me how I felt a little bit <laughs> during the, the whole COVID uh, life. But, um, you know, I also was on a trajectory uh, that I thought was gonna continue and, you know, had some off, North America gigs, you know, going to Guerrero and all of these things, the things, the things, the things, and hustle, hustle, hustle. I was not even home for like two weeks at a time, maybe tops before I was somewhere else. And then everything stopped. And um, I guess I had lots of all different types of questions, like what, what is the, am I gonna be able to make work? What is the work that I'm gonna make now? Um, what is my place in the community anymore if I can't go to these gatherings and help? Just, just all different types of questions. And so um, I'm lucky that I've been able to start doing new types of work uh, and also start doing video work. And I really don't understand how this is working. I, I got some grants, but every month I have worked. I haven't had to get another job. Um, because I keep on having gigs and I cannot explain it. You know, if this was, uh, you know, February 2020 and I looked at my calendar, I would freak out because I'm not booked up. But I'm not worrying about it right now because um, sometimes the universe just provides and I just I keep on getting asked to do work. And every time I think, man, well, you know, perhaps I should go and uh, get a job at the mall and, you know, <laughs> something else, another gig comes, another contract comes. So um, at this point, I guess what's important to me is just being open and just being willing to understand that I do not understand that I'm new again and that it, that's okay. Yeah. yeah it's, it is quite a moment. Um, and, uh, uh, and after a time where reality seemed to be stranger than fiction, it was not really imaginable what is, was happening. The entire world closed down, perhaps the first time that all theaters for a moment time were closed down, mosques that haven't been shut down in 1500 years, uh, closed down. And even in Shakespeare's time, um, the players were able to go outside London during the plague. And, but here it wasn't so, you, we are slowly restarting. You are part of that. That is why it's so important to see, you know, what are you doing? What's uh, um, emerging? What's appearing like on a stage when the light goes on, something appears and your work is something that is appearing now. Miriam, um, tell us a bit about uh, your work and how, how do you feel at the moment? Um, sure. I, I realize in my intro, I didn't mention, um, I'm a writer. I work in several genres, including plays, poetry, and prose, and I'm also a performer, um, stage actor, and singer. So um, it's weird to answer this question specifically in London because they've lifted all types of restrictions, which I'm really not used to. Like, so it's grocery store anywhere, there people are maskless. Um, and it feels strange to like watch capitalism's machine kind of like trundle on um, unsupported by scientific 
consensus. Um, uh, and especially to, to think about what that means for access in a time when actually us moving online has meant that like theater performance is a lot more accessible to so many more people. Um, whether it's because of literally like people who can't get to a theater um, because of ability or distance or anything else um, to like captioning being uh, easily available because of like tech and all of those things. Um, and so I guess I think about sort of like as things return to normal, which they're not, but like <laughs> the air quotes are there for a reason. Um, what of that sort of like we'll, we'll continue um, including as part of our practice. Um, it's been a little freeing, honestly, in a lot of ways, because like I, I think the most miraculous thing about my play for this festival is that there's four different artists working in four different time zones who are across oceans from each other, who are all dialing in and doing the same thing. Um, and that wouldn't have been how we did it before. Um, I think in terms of like the, the timeliness of the work that I'm making or anything like that, um, I actually think I, um, it's not ever been a concern for me because I'm, I'm, I'm an Egyptian immigrant. I'm not, I'm not American. Um, I am a naturalized person. I have the documentation, but I'm not American. I write about Arabs <laughs> for Arabs um, in English, but like I'm really the the audience that I have in mind is always my community first. Um, I'm queer, so I write a lot of queer things. And so already, um, if you're presenting something on a New York theater stage that is about Arabs, um, that is not about how the um, like global North war machine has devastated our countries. It's already considered niche, right? Like what, like <laughs> who would go to see that would is, is assumed to be a very particular subset of people. So I've never really had to worry about anyone like caring about like, why now, why my work, why anything? Because I'm like, you know, if you want to come see it, you're going to come see it. <laughs> if not, like, um, um, the, the perception is, is that like, this isn't for the majority um, anyway, so. Mm, yeah, that's true. I mean, there's someone coined that term, um, non-NATO artists, you know, artists who don't belong to the uh, uh, European American, you know, military defenses, they're kind of out also, you know, as they are not part of the Alliance. And uh, our hope, of course, and prayer is to, to, to include that and open it up. Um, Ty, um, why did you, select uh, Mora's work, what do you feel is needed at the moment? What contribution, you know, do you think can, can theater performance music that make? Oh my gosh, an opportunity to gush about Mora here live. So exciting. Um, you know, I was part of the chain curation and immediately, I don't know, Mora just like popped into my mind because of what Mora mentioned around, I am new again. Right, this idea during COVID-19, which affected a lot of native indigenous communities and people of global majority, I thought like this idea is, um, you know, what, what has changed, right? What has changed from the struggle, from the fighting, from the, you know, all of these hardships, trials and tribulations, and at the same time, joy and light and perseverance and resiliency. Like these are the realities, I think a lot of, you know, um, indigenous um, like dancers and performers and writers like often operate and exist in at least the world and communities that I'm a part of. And so Mora came to mind because of this um, way that Mora um, in, in inherently has a regeneration about her, this idea about rejuvenating natural systems that exist to create sustainability for the future a la, right, decolonialism, and at the same time having indigenization, right, really relating to the earth, the land that's underfoot as she is creating work, um, body work, right, having a language um, that is, yes, spoken in multiple languages from her mother tongue, but also like in the body, and that became really important in sort of just thinking about what people are talking about here around self-care. And so to me, I was like, ooh, 
Mara is going to bring this liberation and nourishment and regeneration and matriculation to the land. And I feel like there's something really interesting about that as it relates to truth telling at a time of reckoning where you have to sit with self, with thoughts, with, um, you know, this idea of deepening a type of democracy in particular here in Turtle Island or the United States, these kinds of things I feel like Mora brings. And so when I watch Mora's work, I was like, ooh, I'm feeling Mora's work right now because it's very healing to me. It's healing to understand and know someone who draws upon ancestral wisdom of indigenous communities and the land, right? Our relatives, the two-legged, four-legged, winged, and the rooted, and can interpolate that and to create it herself to give to other people selflessly just through one particular movement or motion. And at the same time, creates a wave of disruption, right? To disrupt the status quo, to, to disrupt what Miriam is referring to, I think, in terms of, you know, capitalism um, and these kinds of monsters that begin to, to form and not to even, you know, call, give capitalism the, the truth of being monstrous because I actually am a huge fan of monsters. I love it. But, um, but Mora, in fact, um, begins to... Um, create a type of dialogue, a dialogue that we need to hear right now at this time. So Mora's like just came to me like that instantaneously. Yeah, yeah. So Declan or Steph, you know, we hear self-care, healing, um, return to ancestors. Last night we had the 12th century nun who was a composer, Hildegard von Bingen, who also grew, you know, created remedies. You know, is that is that a theme at the moment? Is that feel connected to that? Um, I mean, absolutely. I, I personally feel very connected to that. And Ty, that was so beautiful. Um, how you just spoke of Mora. It's, it's, it's just it resonates with me so much. Um, this disrupting the status quo and disrupting these spaces that traditionally have held certain attitudes have held certain protocol, certain, you know, um, artists there, audience here, um, exchange. It's like more like transactional. Um, and that I have never been a fan of. I think I was like in conditioned to think that that is the only way to perform or that is the only way to create or compose. I also come from a classical music background. I studied classical voice for 15, more than 15 years. And it was, you know, again, so grateful for that training and for those traditions that were imparted on me as a child, because I'm incredibly blessed to have had that opportunity, but also like, recognizing the harm and really the oppression of these things in these spaces that we as existing as queer native people um by just being ourselves are disrupting it and that is a lot of responsibility and that's a lot of weight on us you know and so um i think i've i've been thinking about this since I started, you know, creating my own work and saying I'm not gonna sing other people's songs or I'm not gonna act on other people's things, but what what is it that I need to share for literally my own healing and understanding of my past because it I was passed down Brahms and I was passed down Verdi, but I wasn't passed down the indigenous songs of my ancestors. And I've had to in my work, create that for myself and do that research for myself and, 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 and try things that are foreign to me. Um, but still, I know are a part of me. So, um, you know, healing and return to land and all of this is so um, important to me right now in my work. And it's like, again, this connection of like our vessels and our being to our art, like to be a performance artist, to be a vocalist, it's kind of a mind fuck because it's like, literally if I'm not okay, like I can't, you can lie to yourself, sure. But 
you know, like, um, um, it's just so, it's so like soul bearing. And so um, right now I'm in a place of like, how do I not just have my audience receive, but also like really have them question things, you know, and take part in this like reckoning that really is what I do every time I get on stage. Um, it's like, you know, um, every, yeah, every time, every time. Yeah. And, uh, I think I'm also supposed to, to answer some part of this question. Um, something that, that makes me think about Stefa is, um, so something that I, um, am, have been thinking about and talking about a lot this year and I get into a little bit in the this version of my piece that is part of the festival, but it, it is not super well, super totally explored and is going to be more explored in a future draft of it. But um, I tend to think that a lot of young artists, especially like, especially I, I, more so like classical contemporary musicians, which I'm sure Stefa, you are, are familiar with the kind of person I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, but also theater artists, like young theater artists in Brooklyn, um, tend to overstate the value of their own work. Not, and, and which is not to say that I am, I am, I would just not to say that, like, obviously, I, I very much believe that, like, we change the world through art, we change hearts and minds through art. You, you, you can't expand your political imagination unless you're expanding your imagination. And what expands your political imagination? artists and art and that is how people conceive of a better world and you can conceive of some, uh, how to fight for a better world i have uh in my experience i find that a lot of uh a lot of young artists are very 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 geared towards their art towards their craft towards towards making you know speaking to their truth and making making their thing but um sometimes i think there are or is a certain type of of young artist who uh, like all they do is is their art and they do not have other ways of relating to the world and to people around them. Um, by which I mean like, I'm a very firm believer that if you call yourself an artist, um, you should you should also have other like interests and skills outside of that. Like you should be, you should be a gardener. You should know how to cook. You should, you should maybe you are a nurse. Maybe you are a carpenter. I, I mean, I, I, I just think that, um, I, I, I think that I spent two years, like I really, really started learning a lot about gardening, about sustainability, about composting, about um, all, all of these things that I think that, um, I don't know, I think the kind of, and, and I'm speaking specifically to like people who go to art school, who go to conservatories, who are very much, in, very much like put themselves in that insular world that Sifa was, was, was talking about. Um, I think that I don't know. I think that I've taken two years to really build, figure out like who am I outside of music, outside of theater? Like what are my other ways of existing in the world and relating to people around me? And how, how can I actually, that actually enrich my art making um, and prevent my art making from becoming just a thing that I do in my room for myself and like five of my friends who come to go see it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I can sense, I feel like when I talk about this, it, it sometimes comes out as like art is not important or like art, like being an artist is, pretent is pretentious, which is not at all what I am trying to communicate. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a time of healing, but it's also a time of disruption, a time to also realize, you know, the complex world we do live in our communities. Um, uh, Miriam, how are they um, uh, relating to all of this? See, you're, you're a playwright, you know, and most of people are often performers, and I'm glad we have also a, a written work, uh, also in Prelude. Uh, tell us a bit about your work. Uh, sure. Um, the, the, the work that's included in the festival, or just in general? Why, why, why are you here? What's in it that you feel... Yes, that, uh, that's what I want to share. Sure. Um, so for the festival, like I said, I, I, de I decided that I did not need to concern myself with the timeliness yeah. um, thing or, or the sort of like uh, having to speak directly to the pandemic or, or pandemic conditions. Um, so I decided to just work on sort of the latest play that I had left in a place where I really wanted to get back to it. 
um, and hadn't for various reasons. Um, I think generally as an artist, I really need to have a deadline that's not my own just like desire to finish a thing. So like anytime I have a container of uh, whether it's like a show or just like a fellowship space where I have people that like will look at my pages or something like that, that is really helpful for me to finish things because otherwise as a writer, I take long walks in Brooklyn and think about the stories and finish them in my head. And that's good enough for me. Like I know what happens at that point. So I need something else to, um, kind of drive setting it down and so i uh picked up this play uh entitled faggy fofi cairo boy um fofi is arabic for it's an arabic word that describes um effeminacy kind of being like spoilt um and it's used derogatorily usually towards um men um and it's uh it's a play that I actually started in a fellowship with Ty in like the year that we spent together at TransLab. Um, so he'll be a little familiar with it. Um, and it's um, it tries to answer the question, can homophobia survive the grave? Um, I don't know if I come to an answer at the end of that, but definitely... Um, it's been contending with a lot of the issues that I have had with my family and community around being a queer person, the silence of the closet, um, all of those things. Um, and then more generally during the pandemic, um, my mental health suffered quite a bit at the beginning, um, partly because of being in the United States away from like my entire blood family and not just worrying that I was gonna get a phone call that something terrible had happened and all of that. Um, I couldn't fly anywhere, I couldn't, like I was just in New York waiting for disaster, disastrous news to come my way um, and was suddenly very socially isolated because of the conditions of the pandemic. And so at the time, um, I needed to fill my time with something and after um, the phase of like, I'm going to cook all the fancy things and eat them alone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and like do the gardening projects and, and all of that. Um, I needed to be making art in community and I had been interested in poetry for a long time. I'd written, I think like six poems to my name in a lifetime of, of trying to write, um, and didn't really feel like it was my genre. Um, every time I'd written a poem felt like a visitation from somewhere that I couldn't tell you where it was coming from. So I just decided to be a little more deliberate about it and put myself very intentionally in a lot of um, learning spaces that actually ended up being like majority people of color by design. Like I, I was taking classes with Kaveh Kanam and Kundiman and places like that. Um, and that was really helpful. Um, and I generated so much work because there was like, nothing else to do, nothing to distract me. And it was a way of just like getting everything that I was churning internally about out on paper, whether the churning was was like contemporaneous to the pandemic or just like my life. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it is, uh, it is quite, um, quite a moment, you know, where we existentially faced, you know, also with death and the wrong handshake, at least in the beginning, we thought could kill us. Um, um, but I think for the indigenous community, which was hit much, much, much harder in much, much higher numbers um, than everybody else, Mara, how does it feel for you now to create art, to do your dance work, which is also unique, maybe you talk a bit about it, but um, um, has something changed in your um, uh, uh, relation to your work? Is something different? Is there a time before? Somebody said it should be AC and BC, before COVID, you know, and after COVID, you know. Uh, um, so it has something changed? Um, yeah, there was something that I was thinking about uh, just generally, and it's that uh, we've already been through the apocalypse here. You know, we we came out of the apocalypse. I'm, I'm very literally, uh, I'll say, for example, for Cherokee people in 1738, smallpox, we lost half our population, like half the nation. And then it happened again. So 
And just like the dismantling of entire society, dismantling of the earth, of everything. So we've come through the apocalypse, you know, something even much harsher than what we have now, like 10 times harsher, and we're still here. And so I remember thinking, um, you know, when people would say the world is ending, I was like, no, the world actually already ended and we've come out on the other side and maybe it'll end again. I don't know. But <laughs> um, and so uh, in terms of has something changed, uh, one thing that has really changed is that I started doing erotic work during uh, during the pandemic. And so because of that, that's actually changed kind of everything um, because I decided to be fully uh, vocal and public with the type of work that I'm doing, um, which means that some doors are opened up and, you know, I'm having interviews and my work is in different spaces. Other doors are shut, you know, no longer teaching artists. <laughs> and so, <laughs> mm -hmm. no, that's okay. I can babysit nephews and things like that. And, um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it was, the pandemic has changed a lot for my work, but also the type of work that I started exploring has changed everything as much as the pandemic as well. And, um, you know, I, I think another thing also has been, how do you reach people? I mean, we, we talked a little bit about this, but um, this idea that I'm, I can't touch you and I may not be able to stand right next to you. And even with the performance, you know, um, the going out to the audience and the sitting next to people and sharing breath with people as part of shows, just these ideas of how, how am I connecting, you know, workshops or, um, and I've really had to broaden that idea and realize that uh, Zoom, realize that, you know, even little videos that people are watching on Instagram or TikTok, uh, they still have value and they still have a lot of value and they still also reach people that I was not reaching before. So I've learned to appreciate that. I've gotten messages from people about Instagram videos, which I did put my heart into, but I was like, oh, this isn't perfect. This isn't Oh, art, you know, <laughs> but people said, oh, you gave me life. I woke up in this morning because of the stance. Thank you so much. You inspired me to do this. And I realized how important all of these ways of communicating are, um, you know, this right now we're not holding hands and kissing each other, but we are still holding space. And this has value and is important and touches people in, you know, in deep ways also. So, and Ty, thank you. That was the best ever, ever talk about my work. So, mwah, mwah. <laughs> mm. how, how is it generally? Um, I mean, last year or this year, also after the Black Lives Matter movement, about uh, the Me Too movement, also the calls for diversity. Do you guys feel there is um, more that you hear from the outs, from the world that draws you in, that society says? You know, we need you come in here. Is it more? Is it less? How do you feel? And also your role to make something at the moment. You create work um, um, in the what interests you and that the circle and the circle of what, you know, is good for community or society. How do you feel at the moment? Do you feel um, there is a new connection or has nothing changed? Yesterday, the panel said, you know, we don't feel the change. I am maybe going to answer that not by saying like the the sort of like a comment on the availability of, of like for me Arabic speaking roles or non-binary roles or like anything like that or like um, spaces that are trying to put on Arab or Muslim or Middle Eastern art or any or, or that. I will say that um, I think what what seems to have changed is that institutions know they were not doing well and that they will get called on it. And I actually think that the second part of that has been more important than anything else. Um, and so, like, that's that's a pressure that I appreciate having and hope institutions continue sort of like whether it's kind of like a cynical response or not. Right. It's still a response. And that does mean that that at least the art is available to, to 
to folks. And then hopefully if you like, do the thing for long enough you can be the thing eventually <laughs> um but for now like i'll take knowing that like if somebody's producing a festival and they know they will be trashed on the internet for having only like white cis men be making work for it i'll take that like fine if that's if that is what it has taken actually there's no if that is what it's taken so um yeah I think, um, I feel, I want to say, like, artists and workers feel like they have more bargaining power right now. Like, you know, before COVID, maybe, I'll, spe I'll speak for myself, I was getting, like, $200 for a gig at a music venue. And at the time, I thought, well, you know, this is part of the hustle. This is part, I just got to pay my dues, you know. Um, I'm going to go into my pocket and pay my musicians. I'm going to pay my, my artists. And I thought, it's it's part of the culture. It's okay. Then COVID happens, you know. Um, all these institutions go into a frenzy. Everyone's putting out their their statements and their declarations of solidarity and ta 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 um, and we know, you know, we know mostly it's it's bullshit. Um, and so I feel like artists are just, we're just more, imp I want to say I, I'm more empowered now to one, say no to things that I'm like, this is going to actually deplete me financially, emotionally, <laughs> spiritually, and I don't need this. And it's given me space. And I think that's offering, giving um, more space for for me to ask for more and for me to demand more because I'm like, I know what my time and my health and, and this body is worth. And I know that you can probably make it work. And if you can't, you know, I'm not going to lose sleep over it. Whereas I think in the, I think, and I think this is for a lot of workers. Like I think we're seeing a moment of a lot of strikes, you know, and a lot of people like demanding, you know, we want to unionize, we want to like, we want to like walk out because it's because the conditions are horrible and like feeling like what we went through. Um, you know, we, we're not returning to the same old thing. And it's not about Instagram posts, or, you know, these, these like, kind of superficial shows of, of solidarity with us. But it's like, we're going to make you like, we're going to really hold you. We're going to, we're going to hold you accountable. Um, and we're going to demand more for ourselves. And so I, I'd like to think that that has shifted because I'm seeing, you know, the Whitney workers, Guggenheim, Brooklyn museum, like ev that's so exciting. I was working at a, mu I was a museum worker for many years and I'm like, we're getting paid so little, like we should unionize, you know? And everyone's like, no like I'm leaving or like you know like oh this is just a part-time like whatever that's never gonna happen here and I'm like it took all of us getting fired it took like us being on maybe on unemployment and being like wait like it is possible to make a living and to like to, to like sustain ourselves as artists like stop lying to us and telling us that there's no money telling us there's no resources because like we know who are on your boards. We know what your boards are funding. They're funding wars. They're fun you know, like, it's just, like, we're over it. And the truth is, like, I think even b before co COVID, I was, like, I've always been kind of anti-institutions, you know? Um, but then just, just seeing it all laid bare, I think, has just, I think, really empowered artists because we're, we're, we just realized again and again, like, without us, you're actually nothing. And we actually make you. So, like, what have we got, you know, what have we got to lose to ask for our worth? So I think it's, I think that was a, maybe a positive change, exciting change for us. Yeah, Ooh. I agree with that. I, um, one thing that a lot of the protests and then the, the documents i think we can i think every field has had the documents like the uh equity documents that came out and the the boards you know the people making the equity all of those things um 
I realize that we've been kind of trained and and to believe that the arts, right, and that whole structure is somehow more pristine or less oppressive than a bank, for example. And that's really just not true. <laughs> you know, we've been trained to think it is and accept things. Um, and I just realized that, you know, I was in the hustle so much, I didn't stop to think because I could not about, wait a minute, is this actually fair? Is this actually equitable? Why, why, what's with this gatekeeping? Why am I, you know, why are we applying for these little things and you can't even really um, get to a point where you can apply until you have a certain amount of education and a certain amount of time, you know, just all of these inequities. And I guess for me, I realized one that um, commercial world, we can also work in the commercial world and you know, this is a very kind of small world we've created and we are, we're our own audiences, like the five people you're talking about, you know, and maybe it's 500 or even 5,000, but the point is you can go into Walmart and I'll just use the example of Alvin Ailey, okay, because that's one of the most well-known uh, dance companies from the United States. You can go into Walmart anywhere and from the, you know, people working in the checkout to the manager to every single person in there, probably 90% or more have never heard of Alvin Ailey. They don't know what it, it is. They know nothing about it. And um, yeah, just thinking about this, these little bubbles and systems and how they are not fair and how we can work in it and we can work to make it better, but we are not beholden to stay in the arts. You know, and if I want to do a commercial for a toothpaste company and dance, I'm going, you know, that hasn't happened yet, but I'm just saying <laughs> I'm going to dance in the toothpaste commercial too. Um, also, something that has happened uh, to me personally is that I've got lots of consultations from folks and primarily uh, white arts organizations. And, you know, they'll call up and email for consultations about how to diversify and how to do this. And I have to say, unfortunately, that after lots of labor, um, nothing was changed. And so uh, I see kind of this wanting to hold on to the system, you know, trying to, we're going to make the system better, but actually the system was broken and needs to go away. So um, I'm hopeful that something will change and I don't know exactly how that will happen, but I think if the system has to be put away instead of trying to fix the system, we need to get out of the system, so. Mm, I love that. I'll, I'll hop in here too, and just to, wow, just hearing the words ringing from my ears in this moment from Stefa, Mora, and you all who have spoken, but thinking about, I've been thinking a lot about yes to the social power and then yes also the collective power of artists coming together you know to to make a new so that has been really exciting to me and and then on the personal level too this idea about accountability and ethics um relating to sovereignty and people having sovereignty over their own bodies over the art that they're making the places that you're showing up to to speak to sing to to create art and i because i do feel like art is everywhere it's not just in one single location but art is in the garden it is in the kitchen art is walking and building a staircase to a miniature home that you have gotten and pulled it to a land where you will now live and practice your art every day, right? Lee Markle says that freedom is created outside of the box created for us. And I hold on to that quote and it's, you know, a First Nations quote from Canada because I'm thinking about how um, sovereignty begins to find its way into the art making. Otherwise, it then starts to become extractive. So what I have noticed about, you know, the institution or statehood, right, is this idea of um, there has been a time where it was like, what can I get, right? And then it's changing to um, what do you need? And then sort of folks that have been falling in the camp of, right, what can I get being extractive and sort of appropriative with arts and artists in all of the ways have really um, fallen by the wayside. And artists are now, because of technology, right, have built sustainable and cyclical places to build art, to create our own sort of 
um, places for feedback, for, um, you know, collaboration. And I feel like uh, individuals that are trying inside, that are trying to change the system, et cetera, are also um, really understanding this idea about um, social jurisdiction to, and understand their own, that um, cultural capital has a type of power in it, right? So a lot of that um, funding and things, I think, is becoming really important. So it allows artists to create art so that we can care about things like our hair and condition it every day and comb through it if we need to and spend hours untangling things that get stuck inside of it. And of course, I'm using hair as a metaphor here because y'all have fabulous hair. But, um, you know, this idea about like, let's let's start caring about these these moments where we need to have unstructured time to create the real things for change. And folks that are starting to understand that who do have the means and funding and who do have operated maybe in a white supremacy model are starting to change because of classism, essentially that exists I know here in, in Turtle Island. Folks are putting their money in that because of the social movement, because of the atrocities and the fallen warriors like George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, right? These folks have taken bullets in the back and the head in their art for us, right? For us so that um, we can say, hey, y'all, we ain't doing that anymore. We have new messages, new things to make and create. And one thing that you cannot take away is the imagination, right? The imagination is, is invaluable. And that that's a thing I think that I'm starting to see in, in artists is the imagination get even more creative, which is exciting to me. I haven't ever had to say this out loud. So like I, I'm i thinking about how to even say it. I hope I express myself how I intend to. But like one thing that I wish institutions would realize is that like it is a zero sum game. Like <laughs> redistribution means that like some of y'all are going to just have less, like less time, less money, less whatever. Um, and that there isn't like a magic way to break out of that. There isn't like more is more or, or, or whatever the, the narrative is. Like if you want to put on art made by people of color, by people of like gender variant experience, by whatever, whatever like your di the diversity flavor of the day kind of is, that means there will be less for the people that you would normally be funding. And there's just no way out of that, you know, like, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, institutions, you know, will have to realize that you should invite people to sit down with you at the table and, um, feed, but also say, here's a table for you where you can do the in to why doesn't a large organization say type, you know, do something. Why doesn't a dance company say, well, create a work, you know, and, try things out and i think this is um, um, missing that existing big structures which are very hard they also struggling for survival lincoln center theater says we get 0.1 percent of our revenue comes from the city of new york we have to fundraise everybody thinks we're so big and great you know but we work so hard but yes um, um let me look at often at uh, um, paychecks of the leaders of big museums and arts institutes are gigantic you know, compared to the museum worker, who is it really worth 20, 30 times more what they do and uh, other relations, right? And I think institutions will have to look at that and should um, look at it. And um, some people actually, you, you mentioned, uh, it was interesting, this work strike, you know, and some people do say, what it will take is all artists should just say for a year, we just don't work. We will not work under these conditions. I'm saying, adjuncts at universities, you know, six over 60 or 65% at NYU are no longer you know, professors, tenure, they're all adjuncts or disposable, paid little, even though the students pay so much and this kind of part of this machine. Um, and people say, they should strike. Do you th feel, uh, what does it take um, to even get a more result? Is it, um, it, would that be thinkable? Or what, what are strategies? What do you hear from your communities? What do people do in a way as you know, um, uh, Stefa said, well, we organized, you know, we got fired, but people got together. Is there a way? You, do you see something? Do you hear something? Are any one of you part of a movement? Uh, 
Oh man, Frank, I'm thinking about this table. I'm like, without artists, there would be no table. Who would design the table for people to sit and be at? So that's that's where my mind went. I'm like, wow. <laughs> You know, so much design in that table. But one thing I'll, I'll quickly say here, too, that I think is important is about fostering and building relations, right, which is stems from Indigenous philosophy about about that, right, and not just people, but the earth itself. And I feel like uh, who, who are the collaborators, right, just like as artists, we all collaborate with different people, you want to be a, a, you know, a good collaborator and show up. So forming and fostering and cultivating relationships relations and being in right relation, which means, right, your actions and um, accountability for self become very important. It's like when you enter a, I don't know, a relationship with a beloved, you want to be like, like such an awesome beloved that um, the things that you do and say and, and are can, you know, really be reciprocal in some kind of way of, of, of agreeing upon that. So I think that's becoming important. And I don't know, Moore and I are in um, a part of different indigenous circles that have developed across the country, one with like the Western Artist Alliance and, you know, with Indigenous Direction, our work with Larissa Fast Horse and really wonderful artists where we just sort of are often our, you know, our own circles and things like that, having these conversations. So I think, you know, I know Native artists are beginning to talk to each other and find new ways to develop protocols, right? So it's not just um, someone gets quartered and it's like one and done or that's it, but we are like beginning to reclaim that kind of power about saying, hey, what do you think about working with these individuals or this system? So I think that's important. Um, and I'm, I'll let Maura speak here because there's some other things I know Maura is a part of as well. So thank you so much, everyone. Okay, there it is. Um, you know, this reminds me of just the fact that we, everyone has different roles, right? Um, and we cannot, some people will be spearheading movements and some people will be uh, sending out the emails. Some people will be sharing. And so I, I have, there's some, there's many things going on and you know, at some point I thought, well, I can make work or I can be on this committee and this committee and this committee and this committee and this committee. And there, all of those things are valuable, but we each have a part that we're supposed to play in this world. And so for me, I know um, I am a part of lots of different discussions and I, you know, provide whatever information I have from my, you know, upbringing and the experiences but um, at this point, I realized, okay, I'm here to participate and to give ideas, and then I, I can do. But in terms of the planning and the, you know, I'll be there, for example, if you start that community garden, I'll be there to weed. I'll be there to weed always. Don't ask me to come up with the overall reaching goal of this garden, but I will be there to weed. <laughs> so that's my thought about that is that, um, it's, I think it's easy to kind of get lost and, oh, wait, got this way. Oh, wait, got to go this way. And I, for me, it's just knowing that um, the garden cannot happen unless someone does weed because all of the, you know, the corn and the squash are going to be choked by the morning glories or whatever. That's a true story, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that just knowing that, that it doesn't mean that I have to have my face, you know, on the front line at this strike maybe i've cooked dinner for everybody because they've been out there for 12 hours you know so that's that's what what i feel my role is and uh, i just think it's important that people not feel shame or pressured to be in a role that might not be where their heart is supposed to be because uh, all of those things are important you can't have a movement or an action without people doing little tasks or seemingly little tasks or all different types of things, which may or may not be as visible, so. Um, I have maybe like a two-part answer to that question. Um, uh, the first is, is uh, I think Steph has said it already, like just to say no sometimes, and I recognize that that also is a privilege sometimes for some people um, to be able to say no, but um, oftentimes institutions will 
use the promise of their reach or their resources or whatever to um, try to get you to accept conditions that are um, not to your benefit in any in any way. Um, I was asked to, to talk at Columbia's um, writing program, their MFA, which regularly puts students into massive amounts of debt with nothing, sort of like no promise at the end of that. Um, and I was asked to do it for free. Um, and it was, you know, like they, they're, they, what they were holding for me is that like they're Columbia, right? And I, still had to spend quite a bit of time writing an email um, that didn't need to be like not rude, but I was trying not to be rude, <laughs> um, right? To just like very politely reject the invitation and to like give them a slap on the wrist at the same time so that maybe they can try to do better, um, right? And, and what they're actually offering me is one spot on their calendar that they are going to fill if I'm not there um, and that's all they're offering me, right? So, so like the the promise of what's actually available is amplified by scarcity, and it's not real. Like, there's a million other things that are available that are not the Columbia universities of the world. Um, so that's that's one thing is to like, if possible, say no uh, if you understand that you're getting into an exploitative relationship. Um, where I break that rule for myself, like I'll, I'll do things for free for um, uh, places that I know are actively working towards a world that is more just, that is the world that I want to be part of. And if that's like a community organization or whatever it is, I actually think of that as tithing, you know, so it's not like I'm not working for free. I'm like, you're making a world possible where I can be valued more as a human being. And this is like, this is my part. So it doesn't feel like I'm working for free. Um, so that's part one of, of my answer. And then the, the other part for me has really been just like creating spaces that are not institutional at all and that are therefore smaller and scaled down and don't have like crazy lighting boards and whatever. But like, I, all you need to make theater is like a floor or a screen or a thing, you know, and, and people who want to make it. So um, starting in like 2015, I want to say, I, I began hosting um, a world music salon, an open mic thing that I run out of my living room. It's been monthly-ish since. I know for a fact that the entrance is... Um, you know, there's a suggested sort of like donation, but nobody is turned away for lack of funds. So you can always come in for free. Um, and I know for a fact that the artists who get paid for the gigs that they do get paid more than f for like working a venue in Brooklyn, right? <laughs> like the economies actually work for everybody involved. And it's because like the people who are there are my friends or my friends of friends and they know this person personally and they want to help them pay their rent and they want to appreciate the work that they're putting um, out into the world. And none of us have to deal with the overhead of like CEO, what's his face, who's like getting most of this money at the end of the day. Um, so I'll just say that, that like, it's, it's nice to do something at Lincoln Center it's nicer that you can always do something any day in your living room. Like that's just always available. Yeah, what I uh, would, would be curious, what are examples of kind of a radical change? In Berlin is a theater which uh, changed now, but the concept I admired was called the Gorky Theater. And it was given, it's one of the bigger five state theaters to a, a Turkish German a director. And their concept was, and basically, everybody who looked like me uh, was out. You know, they, they said, this is a theater for, you know, uh, refugees, for immigrants. So every actor, every director, that was the basic idea, every playwright, even though they made exceptions for close friends, but they were not the, what you think of a German, German, you know, woman. That, so and they're from Russia, from Israel, from Syria, from the Balkans. So, so many people fled to Berlin, also a vibrant city. And they wrote their own plays. It was complicated. And everybody laughed about it and said, you know, how's this going to work out? Just immigrant plays. It's going to be boring. Uh, you know, it's just ideolo ideology, and which is true. Ideology makes for bad theater. You need to still make good performances. Good theater doesn't matter how good your ideological statement is. It's still, you know when something is great. And they started out, and after a while, 
you know, after they tried and failed, but they had a year or two. They created great work. They became the theater of the year. They had the youngest audience. They were sold out 100% by the seats, and they did exciting work. So I think this is a, a an example in a way. I mean, it already has changed. us are no longer how it is. They should have continued it. But what do you feel? Uh, what institutions, what places, or what things do you hear? They say, this is really something different. I mean, let's imagine New York Theater Workshop would work that way. You know, they have a change in leadership, and they, okay, let's give it over to the to Ty, Ty, Miriam, and Mora, and Declan, you're going to, whatever, hire your friends, bring them in, try something out, and you have two or three years, and hopefully something great will come out at the end. It's not going ever going to happen. Also, there's not the funding there. They are under real stress, you know, to keep everybody going. But um, but what did you hear about, or what do you admire? What is, like, that? I like that. What Something I don't know, we don't know. Um, Frank, just to comment about the example you just gave, I, I think actually like what that theater did was less cultivate the artist than cultivate an audience, <laughs> right? Yeah. And that's like, that's because the artists have been there, they've been making work, it, right? Um, and even their space, they had a nest, they have a place. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. But what I'm, but what I'm saying- Subtitles, every show was in Turkish, subtitles. You know, there's something where we don't even think about it. Why isn't every theater show Spanish subtitles? In New York City, the white uh, 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 people are in the uh, minority right now. There's over fifty percent. Six percent is is not, is non-white. You know how can that be? Where are the stories? What do we see? Why isn't there a small indigenous Native American theater? Just ninety-nine seats doesn't even have to be made. Why is that not existing? There are four hundred theaters. You know how shocking in a way. Um, I, I, why I think, well, colonialism, right? Like it's, it's colonialism. It's this idea about not valuing arts and the makers who are doing it and creating objectivity around the art itself, right? Like it's sort of how can I get these things for power and for money and of all the things that we need to also live as artists, which, right, provides a sort of catch-22. But I definitely um, think it's this idea about colonialism. It's the great colonial project. It is uh, not allowing people to uh, envision liberation or have imagination and or remember, right, things of the past so that those things can be, as I think Stefa mentioned, for future generations to come, right? So the idea about re-remembering, re creating blood memory I think is so important and this is just like right my perspective and point of view coming out of indigeneity and even thinking about that and how complex it is but I think it's right like it's this um you know wanting it to be cookie cutter only one thing and that one person can be the dictator and owner of all of those things um to not have democracy we kind of you know scarcely saw a little bit of that in you know, in the United States um, and Turtle Island with the orange dumpster fire that was, right? Like a year ago, the people were walking on eggshells um, in our lands there in Turtle Island where we are welcoming people of the global majority, right? In exchange of culture, in exchange of languages. And we're like, WTF, what is this? So there is um, a political ties too about putting laws on what should be people's birthrights, right? So the theater, the art is a microcosm speaking to something uh, something larger at work in, in terms of what Adrian Marie Brown refers to as a fractal, right? It's a microcosm of like something greater, the great colonial project as I'm thinking about and neo-colonialism as well. Mm. I think they once did a, a survey for all New York City departments, like a fire department, health department, police department, on diversity. Uh, Tom, uh, I think Finkelpearl at the time, who came in, wanted also really to make a change um, and to know what's what. And I think only 2% of the entire people working there, you know, were like non-white. It was the worst offender of all departments, I think was, if I understand right and remember right, was this, you know, the cultural 
a department, you know, and um, and so things, you know, do need to change. But again, back, what are, what are examples? What did you like? Who I know Soho Rep, I think, does great work, also fair payment and, and the workshops they host and others. And, but what are examples where you guys, what you know, what do you look up to, um, institutions, people, um, what should our listeners follow and look at? Um, I'd, I'd like to say something about this. I may not answer exactly yeah. how you, but I, yes, I'll say something good. <laughs> um, I What I really love is, um, for example, I'll just give an example. I did a workshop a while back at Haskell Indian Nations University for, it was either in the Empowerment Summit or the Suicide Prevention. I can't remember. I've done both. Um, another time when I went to the Warm Springs Reservation in Oregon. Um, neither of those places had a big budget, you know. Um, but for example, at Haskell, I did have a fee. However, um, the workshop was, you know, as best as they could was played up in a, not, you know, not an over way, but I mean, they, they highlighted the importance of it, highlighted the importance of the work. I was introduced, I was gifted a mug, which I still have. I was thanked profusely and I was fed. Um, at Warm Springs, they picked me up, you know, they drove me around. I was fed also, also gifted with things. So to me, um, communities and places that may or may not have high level of funds. The understanding that we can also trade, we have trade here, you know, um, to me is of great value. So institutions or communities or places that say, hey, I only have $250, but I can pick you up and you can stay um, at my grandma's house and we will feed you and then we will sing your praises to all these other places and maybe you can get some more work down the road. And you know, so this, this idea of trading and um, the embracing of this very old system where it's not always based on money, um, so in kind and fair, uh, looking at the work fairly and valuing it, but understanding you can also trade. So uh, to me, that is some good work that I see being done and that is exciting because it's also a very indigenous way of, uh, of being. Yeah. Uh, I have a, I have, um, my answer is sort of the opposite of, <laughs> almost the opposite of Maura's uh, in that mine is very granular and does have to do with money, but um, uh, I was really, really, surprised in a beautiful way and uh, almost couldn't believe it when um, we're probably, some of us are probably familiar, when Mai Yi, the, the theater company, the Pan-Asian theater company um, in New York announced that they were eliminating 10 out of 12s, going to a five day work week and guaranteeing um, $21.50 an hour for all of their workers along with benefits. Um, and I was like, whoa, my, I mean, that is a, that is a small theater company. I mean, and they say in their statement, they're like, we are a pretty, we're a pretty small culturally specific theater company. We've, we've figured out a way that we can, we can do this. Um, and so like, you know, companies that are bigger than us can probably do this too. Um, and I just thought it would, I just, I, you know, I don't, I don't have anything, anything to say other than like, that is, I guess what I am saying is that I don't have a lot of answers for like, what are, uh, you know, what are institutions or companies that I uh, admire or I think have, are doing positive things or, or you know, I, I really struggle to find an answer. I mean, that's part of why I've sort of pivoted away from working in the theater full time because I, I, I wasn't finding any sort of, of that fulfillment. Um, but that is that is sort of one of the ones that's come to mind in the last couple of months of that was that was a time where I felt very impressed by it, by a company um, and by a material, a material commitment to something. Yeah, the the first um, maybe organization or like theater company that came to my mind. I'm also similar to Declan. I really am like, what institution do I want to put on blast? You know, like what institution do I want to like uplift? Um, 
but not many. But um, they're called Superhero Clubhouse, and they're a group of um, policy people, theater people, lawyers, scientists, um, and their goal is to create theater around climate justice. Um, And they work in schools, um, and they help, you know, like kids in elementary school make plays and write their own plays and then adult actors um, and performers then like put on these plays for them. Um, And I I have friends who work with them who are on their board and um, you know, they're like working with Brooklyn kids. And um, I just think that's really, really important work that's happening. Um, You know, they're doing plays outside. They're doing like, um, yeah, just like, occupying space in that way and also like you know having it come from like the youth in New York I think is just I think it's just really special so that's one place that I've heard of you know doing really cool stuff that I think more people should know about Yeah, I'll uplift a couple places that I think are pretty wonderful. And it's because of the individuals who sort of, you know, like what I'm hearing here is, as well as myself, like who want, who are needing to be in, in a different world that currently exists because of the system, because of sort of what we're, was being discussed. And so I was thinking about um, people that have formed collectives and have come together to make work and I'm thinking of David in the Movement Theater Company and Deidre Harrington and those folks who are, you know, holding themselves accountable at the same time of making work and amplifying others. And I just think that Theater Company is doing such great work and they um, produced What to Send Up When It Goes Down, which, you know, became like this viral hit, you know, in terms of a show and a lot of people seeing it. I think um, the Chicago Puppet International Festival, where it's like they take over the city and you do different various puppet works from around the world that's helmed by Blair Thomas, I think is doing really wonderful work and partnering with community organizations where they already are doing that work. So it's more of building like a partnership within there and, and, and leaning on the leadership of artists as well as you know, people of global majority, of people who are trans and non-binary leadership in taking those words of wisdom and saying like, okay, how do your community grandmothers need to be paid? Do they need to fill out a W-9 form by the United States government to receive their stipend of $50, right? These are real things that start to happen where as an artist, like, sure, you want to dramaturge as a grandmother, but do you ask grandma that, you know, hides the cash under the mattress to like fill out all of these forms? I mean, it's just, you know, so there are, it's like the little things, the little things <laughs> matter, right? Feeding people, do people provide food for to have feasts and to, to have conversation, right? That is becoming important. So those are just some companies that I'm really looking at and I'm really excited by the work that's coming out of these places. Mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> we, are, we are getting closer. We have like four, five more minutes or something. But uh, so the really thank you. And I, it's also uh, a little bit telling that little silences in between that you had to think. Uh, what is there? What institution? Uh, you kind of, you know, there are five people sitting here who know the city very well. Um, and from your point of view, you know, so that's, uh, it shouldn't be. Um, it also t- tells something. But um for, let's know what inspired you in this time, like for creating now, but maybe over the last year, what uh, music or book or like very or film? What did what did what did you look to? What gave you um, you know some some gas for your motor and kept your knives sharp and uh, and keep kept you running? What what maybe share that and then we'll, we'll end the panel. Miriam. Um. This isn't uh, this isn't like a show that I went to see or or anything like that. But um, I was reading <laughs> um, Daniel Defoe's Journal of the Plague Year um, when the when the pandemic started, <laughs> um, 
because I, I was trying to make, I did make a book length erasure poem from it. Um, but I was reading that and it was strange just how, if you, if you modernize the language, it's really the pandemic that we're living through now, which like in some moments felt hopeless. <laughs> and then in other moments, um, recalling what Mara said at the top of this, like the world has ended several times whether the sort of like, um, you know, the like the the the, the narrative that that um, is most accessible to most people, which is typically like white and Western, all of that, um, whether it acknowledges those worlds ending or not, um, and so that weirdly fed mm -hmm. me a little bit when it really did feel like, um, yeah. yeah, like what's tomorrow going to look like? Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. Declan, what 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 did you listen to, read, watched? Right now, I'm uh, I can't stop listening to Japanese ambient music, uh, which is not really something that has influenced my work yet, uh, but it is become a very core part of my morning and my journaling. Uh, is I put Japanese ambient music on and I sit with my cat for 20 minutes each morning and I don't look at my phone and I uh, just sort of uh, am present with my thoughts. Um, in terms of things that like have, have influenced my work, I mean, I, I, I've mentioned a few times, I, I, I've just started to go and see shows again and, and uh, uh, sit in, go, go see live performances and that's been, uh, my, my cats are not the kind of cats that come when I ask them to come. Uh, if, if he wanted to be with me right now, he would, and he does not want to be with me right now. And I have to respect his space. Um, but, uh, I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like I'm just starting to, to sort of engage with live performances again. And that's been really wonderful. Oh, you know, actually what I'll say is, um, I've, uh, become, I've, I've gone, gone to a lot of drag shows over the summer and have started to try to immerse myself into the New York drag community. And um, I was not, I did not know a lot about or mm -hmm. attended a lot of live drag performance before the pandemic. Um, and now that's a pretty regular, it's probably one, probably one of the only um, things that I really regularly like go out yeah. of my way to go and go to go see. Um, yeah. And that's been really wonderful. And that is, that has definitely been uh, impacting my. Thank you. Yeah, my it's cool. The drag community, they went out there, performed in restaurants, places, bars, clubs, and uh, they were out there when people weren't doing. Um, Ty, what, what, what did you listen to and uh, or read? Oh, wow. Well, I've been reading. Well, one, two things. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I've been reading The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. Total sci-fi nerd here, imagining worlds and world building. So I've been doing that and like playing, let's see, Beat Saber nonstop and other like virtual reality things. D and D, you know, hit me up. So I just, um, yeah, this, this, and um, for music, yeah, I've been listening to just a lot of bird songs because like I've also been birding. I got got me a pair of binoculars in New York City so I can look in apartment windows and also look at birds at the same time. Fantastic. Very <laughs> exciting. Amazing, Stefa. Um, let's see what. Okay, I also bought binoculars. I was going to go to this bird watching course, but then of course, like, I think I slept in because it was like 9 a.m. in Prospect Park, but we should go like bird watching or something. Oh my gosh, <laughs> let's go. Let's do it. Um, I mean, um, hmm, what have I been? I had a performance popped into my head that um, I experienced at the end of the summer, which was... Um, an artist named Guadalupe Maravilla, who had been creating um, these huge gong sculptures and would have artists with him um, and host sound baths. And I was able to go to this incredible hour long sound bath with my mother. And it was outside in Socrates Sculpture Park, which is a beautiful park in Queens. Um, and, you know, he, he creates these sound baths um, 
a lot of the times for the general public and then also specifically for cancer survivors. Um, and it was just, just to experience this outside and just see the way that even though the sculptures were so beautiful and otherworldly alien, you know, it's definitely, it was called Planet Abuelex, which is like a gender neutral um, grandparent word. Um, and just to be there with my mother and like, you know, she had back pain, I have back pain. And it's to really like move things in your body, this somatic experience, like, it just felt so um, beautiful and connected. Um, and outside, to experience that, yeah. yeah. And outside in a park, you know, something, you know, what, you know, we are looking, trying to get involved in. Mara, you're at the hour end. Sorry, we let you, but to tell us a bit. I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, yes to the, I, I want to have one of those sound baths, by the way, that sounds wonderful. Um, but yes to the outside. So I'd say that some of the things would be one outside itself, because I'm not based in the Napa Hoking and I'm, I've been in places, I've moved around a lot actually during this pandemic, but I've been in places that have access to beautiful forest and outdoor spaces. And so the sun and realizing that I still am able to be in the forest freely without having to worry about a pandemic at that moment, that has been uh, very inspirational to me. Also, um, you know, Instagram and TikTok. I have watched a lot of stuff, <laughs> you know, lots and yeah. lots of videos, yeah. just lots of people's work, actually. Lot, there's lots of wonderful stuff. Yeah. Um, so that has been inspirational. And then two companies in particular, um, Virago Nation, I think they're based in Vancouver, BC. Uh, it's all indigenous burlesque company. Uh, their work has been... Uh, and very, you know, sex worker friendly and supportive. Um, and then also Santee Smith, who's on Six Nations, um, and her work that she's been doing with the pandemic where she actually grew a stage. She grew, you know, like with sunflowers and had it built um, on her family's land on the res and where there was a you know, so there was a stage there and then there was another performance where people walked through the forest and performers were at different places and there were projections. So that has been very inspirational to me in terms of, I was like, oh, well, I could just do that all the time. I mean, it's, it's really neat. So. Yeah, fantastic. Well, that, that, is, that is good to know. There's things out there we don't know about, maybe we'll never know about, but they're great and wonderful ones. And that, um, we should, you know, join them and we should, you know, um, be part of um, the world that is larger than us. Someone once said in our Seagull Talks, it's not enough uh, to feel, you know, how is life in somebody else's shoe. Take your own shoe off first, you know, and uh, mm. before you do that. And I think this is a, a big call. And it's interesting, birds, nature, parks, um, um, healing, um, but also the rupture, a real disrupture. So there, it is quite a, quite a moment we live in and, only when we look back five, 10 years from now, we will fully understand it. Thank you for joining. It was fantastic. Tonight at seven, uh, Stefa, um, all join. And um, and thank you, uh, Ty, uh, Maura, De Declan, and everybody, you know, who, Mariam, and for, for joining us. Thanks to the Siegel team, Tanvi, uh, Andy, um, Gaurav uh, in Mumbai is a fantastic, I think, um, um, if you look under the hood of the car, um, and um, that we normally see just passing by. So thank you and uh, join us again. Thanks for our listeners, really, for taking time out. It's very, very busy time. More and more stuff is um, uh, is out there. So that means a lot to us. And thanks to HowlRound again, of course, for hosting us. What a fantastic, great place. And they are one organization to look to. What they did, what they contributed in this time is uh, stunning and amazing. So bye-bye, and I hope to see you all soon. And to our listeners, please join us again. Thank you very, very much.